Live for God Studio Productions. This is Light Streak with Don Martineau. Okay, our, our subject is give the Holy Spirit control today. Not just who's the Holy Spirit, how does it work, all his powers, what he does, but how do we get that power in our lives now, today? That's what I'm talking about. The how, the why, and the when. How many of you celebrated June, June 9th this year? How many celebrated June 9th? What, no birthdays? Nobody, nobody celebrated June 9th? Okay. Well, you should have. I didn't celebrate it either, and I should have. And we're going to talk about why June 9th was such an important day this year. I recently read, few are atheists in theory, but many are such in their feelings. Few are, are atheists in theory, but many are such in their feelings. They are hopeless because they are godless. That describes three guys who mean an awful lot to me. Bill, Artie, and Mike. Bill is, was my college roommate, and we still talk once or twice a month. In fact, uh, uh, almost a week ago, I flew out to Portland. He lives in Vancouver, Washington, right over the Portland border. In, in the state of Washington. I flew out there for a week and spent time with him. And a lot of you uh, in this class I know were praying because I've talked to Bill about his salvation, about why he needs to make a change in his life. Now we're close. Uh, Bill was very gregarious in college. In fact, he got kicked out a little bit too gregarious. Uh, so, uh, but hey, we still maintained our friendship and even though we're a little bit different, I think an awful lot of him. So I spent a week with him, and uh, um, I, got, I got a chance again, not the first time, again, to talk really one-on-one -on -one just about him making a decision for Christ. And again, a lot of you were praying that Bill's heart would be softened. Well, uh, it wasn't successful this time. But the Holy Spirit is the one who makes the, does the conviction. We're just the vehicle. So I continue to pray, and I'm going to ask you to pray for the, these three guys uh, that the Holy Spirit will soften their heart and they will all come to know Christ. The second guy is Artie. Artie's one of my very best friends from high school, and we still talk. And uh, uh, Artie, Artie right now doesn't have a lot, want a lot to do with God. Uh, nothing's happened in his life. He's just never, never been that close and doesn't, doesn't really want to do it. The third one is Mike, who's my brother. I've got two brothers. Uh, both of them are younger, uh, but Mike lives in China. So he, he retired, went to China, uh, married a gal over there, and doesn't want to come back. She's over here now uh, because her son is now going to, to Ohio State. And I don't think she wants to go back to China, so they're going to have to work that out. But, I know, you know. But uh, Michael is a very smart guy, but he sees all the abuse in religion. He sees all the things that are going on that religious people have done. And he said, if there really was a God, that stuff wouldn't happen. And I can't, he, in fact, he doesn't even want to talk about it anymore. We still talk every week. Every week on Saturday morning, Mike and I talk. From, he's in China. So we, we have a very close relationship, but I still can't, I still can't get him to uh, make that decision. But again, the Holy Spirit's the only one that can really do that. So if you will, for me, pray for Bill, pray for Artie, and pray for Mike. And I'll, I'll let you know how that goes. But first, is the Old Testament really connected to the New Testament? Is the Old Testament really connected to the New Testament? There's two sections of the Bible, obviously, the Old Testament and the New Testament, but they actually do relate to each other. The Old Testament provides the historical and theological context for the New Testament. The Old Testament provides the historical and theological context for the New Testament. We can look at the Old Testament, we see the, the history of the Jews, we see the covenant with Abraham, uh, we see how the Jews have progressed, the rebellion they had, all the different ways that God tried to talk to them. Uh, we also see the theological context uh, for the New Testament. Uh, God tried to speak with prophets. He spoke with judges. He spoke with kings. People wanted kings. All, all three of those were, were how God tried to, to deal with the Jewish people who are the chosen people and still are uh, in, in the Old Testament. The patron saint, St. Augustine, said... The New Testament has lies, lies hidden in the Old, and the Old Testament 
is unveiled in the new. It's one continual story. Now, when I had a chance, or when I have a chance on my own to read, I have to admit, I rarely go to the Old Testament. Well, let's see, I want to read the book of Nehemiah. Bless his heart. I mean, I don't do that as much as I should. I go to James, I go to books that I like in the New Testament that I've already read, and I'll read them again. Uh, but the more I look, the I, more I see that there, there really is that connection between the Old and the New Testament. So the Old Testament provides historical and theological context for the New. The, old, the New Testament lies hidden in the Old, and the Old Testament is unveiled in the New. It's one continual story. So then the question comes up, is Jesus only in the New Testament, or did he always exist? Well, Scripture tells us that. We can see in John 5, John's 8, 58. Yeah, 8, 58, very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Before, and Abraham, of course, back in Genesis, the covenant that God made with Abraham, that's, that's who he's talking about there. So Jesus is in the Old Testament as much as the New. And if you really go a little farther and look at it, uh, Jesus is found in the Old Testament over, over 300 references, over 300 references in the Old Testament to Jesus, not just to God, a lot more to God. But there are 300 references that we've identified that the Old Testament relates to Jesus. So yes, he's in the Old Testament as well as the New. And <coughs> this is a listing of just some of them. I'm sure you want me to read those, but, but we'll save that for another lesson. The entire Bible, both New and Old Testament, speak and point the way to Jesus Christ. The entire Bible, both Old and New Testament, speak and point the way to Jesus Christ. In very quick summary, very quick summary, there are three specific ways the New Testament differs from the Old. Three specific ways the Old Testament differs uh, from the Old. First way, the New Testament offers greater clarity than the Old Testament. Greater clarity. Hebrews 32 mentions that 32 different times. And that clarity, how? Jesus' teachings are in the New Testament, of course. That gives us a much greater picture of, of what, the, what God's plan is. And uh, the end times. We, although Daniel talks about the end times, Nehemiah has something on the end times, but we see a lot of talk about the end times from Jesus in the New Testament. So that's one way the New Testament differs, in clarity. The second way, the Old Testament was specifically for Israel, but now the New Testament is available for all of us. We see in Romans, uh, Paul's talking, and he says in uh, chapter 11, I am talking to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. That's Paul again. I take pride in my ministry. Now, was Paul Jewish? Yes. Paul was Jewish, but his, his, his mission is to the, his ministry is to the Gentiles. And then he says in verse 14, in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. He wants some of the Jews to get jealous, the envy, and to come to know Jesus Christ. And uh, that was one of, his, one of the reasons for his ministry to Gentiles. He also talks about the branches in verse 17. It's, and think of an olive tree. Uh, I had a chance to, to be in, the, uh, Sue and I got to go to, I think it was last, last October. Uh, we got a chance to go to, uh, to Israel with a group. And I saw an olive tree, and, I saw, and uh, it wasn't at all what I was expecting. But it says here, you will, uh, if some of the branches have been broken off, then you, Gentiles, the wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. So some of the branches of that olive tree have been broken off. The branches are Jew This olive tree represents Jews. Some of, their, some of the branches have been broken off, and Gentiles have been grafted back on. That's us. Most of us in here are going to be Gentiles. A Gentile is anybody that's not a Jew. In, in Paul's time, most, mostly it was Greeks, non-Jews. But, but now, it's anyone who's not Jewish. So if some of the branches have been broken off, Jew, the branches have broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. Okay, so why did those branches get broken off? Why did the other branches get busted off? It says in verse 19, You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief. 
and you stand by faith. By grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast, says in Ephesians. So our faith got us, got us grafted in. Do not be arrogant, and, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, the Jews, he will not spare you either. Okay, so we see that the New Testament is for all of us, not just the Jews. Old Testament is primarily, is primarily just for the Jewish people. Paul goes on to talk in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. So it says many times in the Bible, very clear, that we, are, that we as Gentiles are included. Thirdly, three things that are different. Third, and I think the most important, the Old Testament and the New Testament differ in the availability of the Holy Spirit's empowerment. The availability of the Holy Spirit's empowerment is the third, and again, I think the most, I think by far the most important thing. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was not given to everybody. It was on special times and special situations. The prophets, if you look at the Old Testament, it clearly shows the Old Testament's in Genesis. Uh, Samson, Samson and Delilah with the long hair, he was a prophet. Clearly talks about the Holy Spirit talking to Samson. And he talked to a lot of the prophets, it's clear. But it was only in certain situations for certain people. That's, in the Old Testament, that's all we saw the Holy Spirit working. But in the New Testament, it's different. The prophet Joel, the Old Testament prophet Joel, wrote around 835 B.C. He wrote this. It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your daughters and sons will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. That's Joel chapter 2, verses 20 and 29. So 835 years B.C., Joel came out and said, it will come about, not in this time, but after this, that the Holy Spirit will be given to all. Not just, of course, it was a male-dominated society back then, not just the males, the, everybody, the daughters, the servants, were even going to have the availability of the Holy Spirit, we see in Joel. That's in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is for all believers. Now, the Holy Spirit is for all believers. You have to make that commitment, that decision to accept Christ in your life before you have that availability of the Holy Spirit. And that's over and over again. Jesus talks about it in chapters 14, 15, and 16 of John, book of John. And, in, and we're going to see here in uh, John, this is actually, actually John chapter 7. On the last and greatest day of the festival, that was Passover, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not been glorified. Since Jesus had not been glorified. What that means, Jesus had not yet been resurrected and raised to glory. That's in John 7, 37 39. Then we see in the upper room with the disciples, Jesus answered, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I think Curtis, Curtis used that verse a little bit ago. So whether you're, whether you're a, a Buddha, whether you worship uh, Islam, whether you worship, worship um, your, whatever religion, there's only one way to come to the saving grace of Christ, and that's through Jesus Christ. No one comes except through him. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Now he's talking to his disciples. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives in you and will be in you. He goes on. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. I recently read 
a Christian atheist, Christian now, Christian is a believer. So there's no such thing as a Christian atheist. But okay, a Christian atheist is someone who believes in God but lives as if he doesn't exist. Someone who believes in God but lives as if he doesn't exist. How many of us do that? I did for many, many years. I'll bet you, I'll bet you 30 years of my life as a Christian, I accepted Christ at 23. Yeah, maybe more than 30 years. You know, a long time. Uh, I was a Christian. I was a believer. Uh, and not just, not just believed, Satan believes, is a, believes in, God, in Christ, James says. But I, I gave my life over to Christ. But I didn't live my life much different than most other people. I tried to be good. No felonies. A couple of misdemeanors maybe. But no, nothing, nothing heavy. Uh, but, but, I, but I wasn't uh, living exactly what, what Christ wanted me to live. We believe in God, but we live as if he doesn't really operate in this world. We lack the power that Jesus made available to those who are his, the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, someone asked me even this morning, how come we don't pray to the Holy Spirit? How come we don't put him on the same sphere as, uh, as, as Jesus Christ and God? We should. We should. It's a trinity. There's no question. There's so much written about the Holy Spirit and particularly after Jesus' resurrection. That then Pentecost happened, and the Holy Spirit became available to all born-again believers. As long as we live in this world, we need to daily replenish the Spirit and give Him control of our lives. It's not a one-time thing. Now, accepting Christ is a one-time thing. We, we ask for salvation, we give our life over to Christ, that's a one-time thing. But having the Holy Spirit in your life uh, that's something we need to do, do much more than one time. In fact, we do it every day. How do we change so it's not drudgery to want to live as Christ intended? By the way, I'm watching the clock, time close. Someone's pointed out there's a big red clock right there. I'm not forgetting now. So I talk fast anyway, but maybe a little quicker today than usual. How do we, how do we change so it's not drudgery to want to live as Christ intended? How do we get the Holy Spirit's power to operate in our life? to daily give us his direction, his protection, his power. How do we get the Holy Spirit's power? We talk a lot about it, but maybe not how to get it. It's very simple. Every day, ask him into your life and give him control of your life. Every day. Someone in this class gave me a, a, gave, years and years ago gave me a daily uh, devotional, which we still use to this day. And generally, every day, almost every day, Sue and I, in the morning, We'll get up and we'll read the devotion for that day. Then we talk about the devotion, how it applies, what we each one of us saw in it. But then we have, we, have, we right after that we do prayer, and both of us have, say individual prayers to each other. And one of the things we pray for is we ask for that holy, that holy Spirit, to come into our lives, to give us direction for that day, to give us protection for that day, and to help us let us know where where we should serve that day. Every day we do that, and dog on. We'll come back at supper time, and then, as often as not, a situation will happen, something will occur, and God will, God will have used us somehow. But I know it's not my understanding or anything that Sue and I are doing. It's, it's the Holy Spirit working through us. Ask him and give him control of your life each day. You want his power, give him control. Give him control. Give it, say, okay, God, this day I'm giving to you. I want, I'm going to ask you into my life this day, I want your protection, I need your strength, I need, I need your power, and he will. The famous evangelist D.L. Moody was asked why he urged Christians to be filled constantly with the Holy Spirit. Well, he said, I need a continual infilling because I leak. I need a continual infilling of this Holy Spirit because I leak. Living in this world, we need to daily replenish and give control of the Holy Spirit to the Holy Spirit. It's not a one-time thing. Every day we need to do that. If, if we go on vacation or something, and then sometimes that's the weakest part of me, I don't, I don't do the devotion every day like I should. I don't really, uh, you know, whatever we're doing on vacation, I'm this, you know, we're doing this or that, and I'm not as close as I should be with God. Well, I notice that I haven't asked the Holy Spirit into my life that day. He's still inside of me now, but I'm asking him to give him control, and I want his power. As a Christian, we know we're going to have that Holy Spirit into us as a Christian. But... I don't always let him have control. If you could ask for anything in the world, what would you ask for? If you could ask for anything in the world, 
what would you ask for? Your mind probably goes to Solomon. Remember, Solomon was King David's and Bathsheba's son. Second Chronicles first 10 says, this is what Solomon says, Now grant me wisdom and knowledge, so that I may lead this people. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? So we know Solomon asked for wisdom and knowledge. What would you, would you ask for wisdom? Yeah, right. You know, you know winning the lottery uh, might be on your list. Um, power might be on your list. Or you, if you fantasize, you might fantasize about being the backup quarterback for the Chiefs. Now, fantasy only goes so far. You're not going to be Mahomes. Backup quarterback is the best you can hope for. You know, so, so maybe, maybe, that, maybe you'd fantasize about something like that. What, we, what I miss in this, these verses is we know that God gave wisdom and knowledge to Solomon, but what else did he give him? What else did he give him? We're going to see that in 2 Chronicles uh, verses 10 through 12. God said to Solomon, Since this was in your heart, and you have not requested riches or wealth or glory or the death of your enemies, and since you have not even requested long life, but have asked for wisdom and knowledge to govern my people over whom I have made you king, Therefore, wisdom and knowledge have been granted to you. And I will also give you riches and wealth and honor unlike anything given to the kings before you or after you. So not only did he get the wisdom and knowledge that he asked for, but those things that he probably was thinking about, God gave him the wealth, God gave him the the, the honor, um, and he had the power, tremendous amount. Maybe you'd ask for peace in your life. Maybe you'd ask for real joy in your life. Maybe true love in your life. Or a bit more self-control as life circumstances get harder each day as we all have challenges in our life. What if I told you your wish could be granted now in this life guaranteed? Guaranteed, not gray area. The chapter 8 of Paul's letter to the Romans deals with the Holy Spirit. Chapter 8, good chapter to read. He mentions the Holy Spirit 32 times. 32 times in chapter 8 of Romans. The last verse of the main body of Romans expresses Paul's desire that all Christians experience the fullness of spiritual benefits that come from knowing, understanding, and receiving the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's blessings include faith, joy, hope, uh, power, and peace, and actually many more. The Holy Spirit, something I, for those first many, many years prior, I really didn't understand that the power of the Holy Spirit could be in my life now, and I could have so many different things, that scripturally it says that that it's black, it's not gray area, I don't have to, I don't have to jump through hoops, I just got to ask every day that Holy Spirit to come into my life. Romans, uh, some of those benefits are in Romans 8, uh, 26 and 27. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, right there, that's a big one. We all got different areas in our life that we're not real proud of, that are weaknesses, that, tempt, that Satan knows what our weaknesses are. He tries tempting us. But the Holy Spirit helps us there. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So we've got... The Holy Spirit, once you've act, you know, you've got that power, he's going to look at your heart, knows what you need. He's going to go to God before you even pray about it, before you even ask about it. The Holy Spirit's going to go to God on your behalf. Dog on. Remember, to each one who has a personal relationship with Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit is available if we daily ask and give him control. Give the Holy Spirit control every day and ask for his direction for that day, for his protection, and to show you how to serve just for that day. Forget about next week. Forget about Tuesday. But tomorrow morning or later this afternoon, ask that Holy Holy Spirit to give you 
that power, that strength, that protection. You know, it's embarrassing to say some of the stuff I, that Sue and I have been on trips, and there was a couple of times, absolutely, one time an 18-wheeler came out of nowhere, emerging onto a ramp, and outside, I think it was outside of Dallas, and out of nowhere, this, this 18-wheeler was, oh my gosh, was, was zipping down this on-ramp, and uh, there was only one lane, I couldn't stop. And, you know, I tried to pull over as far as I can, and all of a sudden he was gone. The 18-wheeler wasn't there. And I said, and Sue saw it, I said, what the heck? And then it dawned on me. You know, now that doesn't mean you're not gonna have car accidents. I mean, I'm, 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 that doesn't, but, but, but for whatever reason, for that particular time, and many others I can say, God is, the Holy Spirit's given us protection of stuff that, hey, I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve any of it, actually. So, how exactly will the Holy Spirit change you? Okay, we've talked about you can get that, but you can get the power of the Holy Spirit by asking him every, every day. Just ask him into your life and give him control. Galatians 5, and 23 says, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You can't buy any of those things. Real joy in your life, real, real love in your life, uh, real peace, patience. You know, all these things are fruit of the Spirit. As we ask the Holy Spirit into our life every day, ask Him in, it's a process. You're going to start growing. And those fruits, Billy Graham talks about it like a, a cluster of grapes. When you see a cluster of grapes, one isn't dinky, one isn't big or small, unless the bug's got it, but they're all roughly the same size. The grapes are the same size. It's like you're getting a cluster of these nine different fruits, and you're going to get them all. Uh, you, you're going to see a difference in your life. You're going to see more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, more self-control. You know, that's, but it's a process. It's, and that's, it grows. In addition, it says, if we walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If we walk by the Spirit, if we grow and ask the Spirit into our life every day, ask for that power, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For those of us that are older, I remember Ozzy and Harriet had separate beds. You know, I mean, nowadays, they're gone. You know, you, you need, we don't want to gratify the desires of the flesh, whether it's it's in our mind, or whether it's outwardly, um, it's still a sin. And the Holy Spirit will, will, will take care of that for us, will help us through that. In the New Testament, Pentecost, which is also called Whit Sunday or White Sunday, Pentecost is a day when the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles and became available to all Christians. Pentecost. And I remember Whit Sunday, I had no idea what it was. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, Luke writes that Jesus met with the disciples on the Mount of Olives after his crucifixion, which was after 40 days, he, but before his ascension into heaven, and he gave them the Great Commission. Jesus also tells them to wait 10 more days in the city of Jerusalem so that they may receive the power of the Holy Spirit. So Pentecost, 50 days after Passover. Now, do we celebrate that here in the United States? No. No, we don't. However, I read, you go to Europe, Germany, France, United Kingdom, they celebrate, it's a formal holiday, it's a two-day holiday. Nobody goes to work on that Monday. I'm not sure they're worshiping the Holy Spirit, but, but the countries in Europe recognize it and celebrate it, Pentecost, as a day just as important as Easter, just as important as Christmas. So the least we can do is raise the bar a little bit here. Next year, this year I told you well, it was June 9th. Next year, just so you remember, June, May 31st, 2020, is Pentecost. 50 days after Passover. May 31st, 2020, is Pentecost. We should remember that next year. There's plenty of biblical evidence that Christian joy is not the mere product of pleasant circumstances. Joy is the product or fruit of God's spirit. It's the joy of Christ fulfilled in us. Happiness is getting a new car. Joy is still liking that car 10 years later. The Bible commentator Matthew Henry put it like this. The joy and peace of believers arise chiefly from their hopes. The joy and peace of believers arise chiefly from their hopes. What is laid out upon them is but little compared with what is laid up for them. Therefore, the more hope they have, 
the more joy and peace they have. So he's comparing what we have now comp compared with what we're going to have in heaven. You know, what's laid up for us is so much more than what we, what we have here. Christians should desire and labor after an abundance of hope, hoping for what's com coming up. And God's love poured through the Holy Spirit provides that hope. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit, one of the nine. Paul tells us in Romans 5.5, 5, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. Hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. The power of the Holy Spirit changes everything. Now, is it going to happen overnight? Probably not. But as you grow and as those fruits in the Spirit grow and as your relationship with the Holy Spirit grows, it, it changes. In conclusion, in conclusion, ask and you shall receive. How? Give the Holy Spirit control and ask for his direction, his guidance, his wisdom and protection in your life. When? Every day. Every day. We do it in the morning. doesn't matter when. Every day, ask for the Holy Spirit's empowerment in your life. Why? Over time, his fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control will grow and will be self-evident in you. There are so many other benefits that the Holy Spirit provides to us, like that intercess intercessory prayer with God where he goes for us. There are so many other things. We're going to close with this verse. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Give the Holy Spirit control of your life today. Today, don't wait. A book that got me a lot of help, Sue's dad, uh, uh, he was still alive, I think, uh, gave me a bunch of his books. One was a, a very thin little paperback book called The Holy Spirit by Billy Graham. It was duct taped. He had actually duct tape pulled in this thing together. And that is, you know, he could, Billy Graham could speak in terms I understand. And, and uh, that, with plus the verses that I, that I read, I got, I, I got it. I understood. I recently gave that book to my brother, not the one in China. The one, uh, I got another brother who lives in Arizona. He's reading it, and he's, he's becoming, uh, having that Holy Spirit power available to him. Um, we're going to close in prayer to, in a minute. But I hope that you take this listen very seriously and ask that Holy Spirit into your life, starting right away. Don't wait. That's all he need, we need to do. Dan, we'll be back next week. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. You make the path so clear. You say, little children, come to me. Little children can understand. It starts with taking that first step. We have to give our life over to you. We have to become a believer and recognize that your son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for our lives. And I, do I get it all? No. But do I believe it? I sure do. Thank you for that. Thank you for the change that it made. It guaranteed my, my eternal home. Um, it's, it's provided so much to me. But that next step is being used by you. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, you guide and direct me, as you will everyone in this class. And you let us know where it is you want us to be. You'll give us that protection. Uh, you'll give us that strength and show us where we need to serve just for this day, just for this day. Thank you for your love, Father. In my name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Ten minutes, too.